In this video, we're going to continue our look at the MITS Programming System 2 for the Altair. This package allowed you to develop assembly language programs on your Altair, and it only required paper tape or cassette for mass storage. Now in the first two videos, we went through the process of how the monitor of the package was booted, how the editor and assembler were loaded. Um, in the second of the two videos, we went through the process of edit, assemble, edit, assemble, run, and it demonstrated how quick and easy that was because we did most everything in memory without having to go to our extremely slow mass storage devices. But there, come a point, there comes a point where you really have to write out your program source file or maybe reload it from uh, tape to get started each time, and eventually you might want to save the actual binary file. So that's what we're going to do here today. All right, so we presently have everything loaded and the program we are working on in the last video is in the edit buffer. So we'll run the editor with the re-edit option, hit print. And this is the program we've been working on. This is what we want to save. All right, so the device through which programs are loaded and saved, source file, is the FIL or file device. Now, if you recall from the previous video, we've been specifying that device to be the edit buffer so that the assembler could just read right from memory as opposed to having to go to tape. So in order for us to save this file we've been working on, we're going to have to change that assignment. So the open command of the monitor is used to uh, change the assignment of logical file variables. So the file device is now going to be assigned to the audio cassette in ASCII mode, or text mode that is. So now when we do a load or save in the editor, it's going to go to the cassette. Frankly, if we use the assembler now, it would want to go to cassette because of this assignment. All right, so let's bring up our file. There it is. And now we're going to save it to cassette. The save command is an S. File name, there are three character file names. And it actually validates this file name when you do a load. So, for example, if you say load TST, but it happens to run into a program called, um, you know, ALB, it's not going to load it. It's going to keep going until it finds TST. All right, so we're going to hit return, and it says change sent switch 15. So what it's doing is it's not actually saving. It's waiting for you to take A15 on the front panel and change it from whatever state it's presently in. All right, I'm going to hit record on here. So at this point, our tape recorder is recording idle leader. We want some of that idle leader in the front of the tape, so we'll let that go for a few seconds here. And now I'm going to switch A15, and now it's going to write this out. Now this is a relatively short program at 300 baud. It takes about 15 seconds to get this whole thing written out. And of course, when it's done, we'll get a prompt. Okay, there it is done already. So I'm going to let a little bit of idle tone follow that, and now I'll stop it. All right, so now that has been saved to cassette. So now if I run the editor without the recover prompt, as you see, it's all gone. So now let's try loading that program from cassette and see how we do. All right, I'm going to have to swap all the leads on the uh, cassette player. So I'm going to go to the computer first. Move it from record out to uh, player in, and then move the cassette recorder to the headphone jack. And let's rewind this tape. All right, fast forward it just a bit. All right, so to load a tape, uh, we have our device still set, so we don't have to change that, is the L command, or load, file name. Give it the file name, and now we press play. And again, it's going to scan the tape until it finds a file that's got a header that's called TST. So you don't have to position it exactly, if, especially if you had time to wait, you could let it scan through a file or two if you wanted. Uh, but we've got it started pretty close here, so this should only take a little bit. Okay, there it's done already. Let's stop the cassette. And you can see our program. So now, we can assign the file device back to the edit buffer in text mode, so that now we can run the assembler just like we did in the last video to read from the edit buffer. Undefined symbols comes out, the fact there's nothing listed means that everything's okay. And so now we can run our program. It's at 20,000 octal, if you recall from the last video. It says this program is working. All right, so we can come in here, edit this, change a line, let's change 14. Um, let's see, this has been changed. 
Control Z exit input mode. You can see we've got that now. So now if we assemble that, you can see that we have it where it has been changed. All right, so in all these videos so far, we have used the assembler um, in a mode where it reads from the edit buffer. And generally that's what you're going to want to do, but you don't have to. So for example, what I'm going to show you here is that you can actually come from a source file. You don't have to bring the source file into the editor. So let's go back to the beginning on this uh, source file we just loaded. And I'm going to change the file assignment back to audio cassette A for text files ASCII. So now when I run the assembler, instead of coming from the edit buffer, it's going to go to the audio cassette. Alright, so I'll do AM2 file and you can specify the file name here. That way it only accepts a file that has test in the header. Alright, so we're going to hit play. It's going to have to go by the leader for a bit. And then it's actually going to read the file from cassette. It takes about 15 seconds. And what we'll see is that instead of saying this has been changed, we'll be back to what was originally on cassette. Alright, so that assembly is done. Stop the player. Oops. You can see we have our original because we read that off of tape. Alright, so now let's say you want to um, write out this binary program so that in the future you can just run it as a command in the um, monitor. How would you do that? Well, there's two ways to do it. One, you can do it with a dump command from the monitor here, or you would specify the starting address in octal. Whoops, let me see. Let me start that all over. You specify this. <laughs> okay, I'm not doing too good. One more try. You specify the name of the program, then the starting address in octal, then the ending address in octal, which don't know off the top of my head, what we'd normally do is define a symbol maybe that had the last byte and then have the assembler spit out symbols at the end. But for example, in this case, uh, you know, 80, oops, that's not octal address though, is it? Uh, 70 probably covers it. And then you put in the start address. So you have to know the start address. Anyway, all that can be a little difficult to make sure you get it right. The assembler, however, can do it all for us if we want, because if you recall, the assembler, knows the starting address, it knows the name of the program, of course it knows the beginning and end because it just assembled it. Alright, so let's go ahead and let the assembler do this one. So we'll exit this. We're going to set the uh, file back to the edit buffer so that we'll assemble from here. One of the command line um, parameters on the assembler is whether or not you want to write out a file. A confusingly, means write an absolute file. It means ASCII in a bunch of other places, but to the assembler it means write an absolute file. Alright, so if you do that, and now we'll input from the file, which we've set back to be the edit buffer. So now it's saying set sent switch 15 for dump. Notice the assembler also calls it dump. So we're going to hit record on our tape player. This is now recording um, idle tone. Oh wait, no, I'm on play. This is a, this is confusing stuff, so I need to swap back my uh, connections. Set that to record out. Plug this into the microphone. There we go. This is why you don't want to have to do anything but work in memory the whole time. Okay, so now I'm going to let this record for a while to get some leader tone. All right, now I'll raise A15, just to the opposite state it was, and now it's going to write it. Now this is relatively small, so this should go pretty quick. All right, it's done already. So the assembly went through like normal, and it also wrote that out to a tape. Now what we did is save the one that says this has been changed. All right, so let's, um, let's actually load that from tape by typing the name of the program. So let me rewind the tape to where it was. Except I don't know exactly where it was. We're going to have to let it do some scanning and find it for us. Oh, I have to put all the connections back to play back, don't I? So I'll go back to the back of the computer. 
tape play in, set this back into the headphone jack. Imagine some people just made switch boxes to make that all a little bit easier in the old days. Alright, so if I type the name of the program, it's not in memory, it's not a valid command, it's out waiting for it from cassette now. So I can hit play on the cassette, I rewound to approximately where I think we saved it. So hopefully here it will load it and just run the program. This would be equivalent to loading the editor or loading the assembler. So now it is loaded into memory and it's just another program like loading the editor or the assembler. Alright, um, there are a few more nuances in all this in terms of uh, where the edit buffer is in memory and things like that, but that's good reading in the manuals. So that's what part of this fun is. Keep in mind that if your program gets much bigger than we did here, uh, you're going to have some problems with the edit buffer clobbering the assembler. And there is a way to change that to move the edit buffer up into higher memory so that you don't have to worry about that problem. There's also a few other tricks that are very interesting to read about in the manuals in terms of saving programs, uh, skipping past files on a tape automatically, good stuff like that. So it's a good, uh, a good package to play with and, and learn a lot about how things were done in the old days. All right, that's it for this video. The computer used in this video is actually a Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer accurately duplicates the look and feel, the features, performance, limitations of the real Altair, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside. So you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage computer while you're doing these fun exercises. Be sure to look at AltairClone.com to learn more about this great machine.